January of 2023, I found myself in a complex situation. I was confused and disoriented. I was on the hunt for the perfect camera. A camera that would check all the boxes for what I need without breaking the bank. The only problem was, there were so many to choose from. I didn't know where to start, and I didn't want to make a mistake. So here we are, one year later, after shooting with 20 different cameras, and I'm about to share my journey with you. I think that was good. Before the Film Alliance, I was a guy who made videos for fun and as a hobby. I liked the problem solving aspect and the challenge and the freedom of creating videos. And all I had back then was a Canon T3i my wife got for Christmas one year. It had a kit lens and I had no idea what I was doing. Soon after that, I got my foot in the door shooting professionally for clients and then 2020 hit. And I, like many others, started a YouTube channel and I called it the Film Alliance. Fast forward to January 1st, 2023, you know, that moment I talked about in the beginning, and I had my sights set on a nice new camera that would help me not only grow my YouTube channel, but help me with my client work. I had some connections with Sony, Lens Rentals, and B&H Photo, so it was time for me to cash in and get my hands on the cameras that I considered to be viable options. And that takes us to our first camera, the Sony FX30. The FX30 is a beast of a camera, especially for filmmaking and short films. One of my favorite features of the FX30 is it could de-squeeze my anamorphic shots. It had 4K DCI with the firmware update. It has an internal fan. It can shoot in 422 10-bit and 4K up to 120, but it didn't have that AI chip that the Sony ZV-E1 was rumored to have, and it didn't have the best stabilization in the world. It was also an APS-C camera, which means I wouldn't have the best low light performance. The dual card slot was really nice to have because I had peace of mind knowing that I could do a backup recording of whatever I was filming or taking photography of. It also uses CF Express cards and it could record to one of the cards first and then the second card after that, which means you get double the amount of record time compared to other single slot cameras that were on the market. I was on the fence about selling it and picking up the Fuji X-H2 because Fuji has a look. I can't explain it. It's just filmic. Lens Rentals sent me out the X-H2 and naturally I versed it against the FX30. I wanted to see how it would perform in real world situations and scenarios. And coming in at a very similar price point to the FX30, it could actually shoot an AK up to 30, had 40 megapixel sensor and seven stops of in-body stabilization. So if I was going to pick up the FX30, why would I just not pick up something like the Fuji X-H2? And like I said, it produces a look that Sony cameras just can't live up to even when you shoot an S-Log3 from my experience. Time out. If by the end of this video, you still don't know what camera is right for you, I made a free camera quiz that may put you in the right direction and I'll leave that in the description. All right, back to our video. The color profiles I was shooting in looked so good on the X-H2. I wanted to just go outside and start creating with it. Also, the fact that it shot internally in ProRes was a big time contender because I edit on Max. But one of the problems that I faced is I already owned a bunch of Sony lenses, and if I jump into the Fuji ecosystem, then I'd have to invest a whole lot more money into Fuji lenses. And now we're talking about a massive investment instead of just buying the camera body by itself. But quite frankly, for the price of one X-H2, I could have picked up two Sony ZV-E10s with two kit lenses, which means I would have an A and B camera setup. I was left wondering if that would be worth it. 
this time, I owned the ZV-E10 for over a year, maybe even two years, and I've used it on many different things such as client headshots, as my main B cam and for some fun side projects. Because I already owned Sony lenses, it made the ZV-E10 a great little portable camera to have and made it a very big contender for me to buy a second one. The image quality was outstanding. It didn't overheat. And I even had a company named Seven Artisans sent me out this cine lens, which I made a little short film with with my buddy Todd. And I'll show you some of those images right now. I also made a nature documentary with the ZV-E10, so I got plenty of use out of it and I know how to use it very well. The only problem with the ZV-E10 is it's 8-bit and it can't shoot in 4K60. But if I was to pick up a second ZV-E10, why wouldn't I just stretch a little bit farther and get an EVF and even be able to shoot in 10-bit HDR by purchasing the Canon R50? I rented the Canon R50 and loved that 10-bit HDR video. For those of you who have shot with Canon, the colors on Canons are more bright and vibrant. They have a certain look to them. I still have yet to meet a wedding videographer other than Matt Johnson who doesn't shoot with Canons only. I wasn't planning on shooting any weddings, but why not just get a camera that has an EVF and if I ever shoot a wedding, well, at least I have a Canon camera. And after using the Sony ZV-E10 for so long, I really appreciated that more traditional look of the R50, and it had a better hand grip. With Sony APS-C cameras, you do get 1.5 times crop, and whereas Canon cameras, you get 1.6 times crop. And every bit of that magnification counts, especially when you're using wide angle lenses. And there was an issue with me about Canon's lenses. They don't have many choices compared to what you might get with Sony. At this point in time, there seems to be way more Sony lens options than there are Canon. And like I said, I was already in the Sony ecosystem, so if I decided to go with the R50, I would have to sell all of my Sony lenses and purchase a bunch of Canon lenses. But it's for that reason that I continue to wait, and lo and behold, Sony releases the Sony ZV-E1. Sony released this camera in May of 2023, which was around the time that I was able to get my hands on it and use it for about two weeks. One of the incredible things about this camera is it has the same sensor as my Sony a7S III, and it has a much smaller form factor, which made it a real powerhouse and contender because you could travel with it, it could be portable, and you would also get an insane 10-bit image out of it. It has dynamic active stabilization, and if you don't know what that is, it's when you walk with the camera, it's different than the active stabilization that you get on some of Sony's other cameras. It really does look like you are on a gimbal and you don't need to throw any of that footage through Catalyst Browse. I mean, you could to really soften it out, but when you're in dynamic active stabilization with the ZV-E1, you don't even need a gimbal. But the only problem I heard people complaining about the ZV-E1 is that it overheats when you use it outside in hotter environments. And that wouldn't work for me if I was using it in a run and gun situation and I was shooting outside and the sun was blazing down and even worse if I was doing some type of documentary client work. Up until now, the only camera that I have used and will use in serious client headshots or outdoor documentary work would either be the FX3 or the Sony a7S III. This has been my main ACAM for the past two years. It has two card slots, it has a bigger body, it never overheats, and it has everything that I need. In fact, most of my YouTube videos, at least the headshots, are filmed with the A7S III paired with the 35 millimeter Zeiss F1.4. Now, with full frame cameras comes more expensive full frame lenses, way more expensive than what you would get with APS-C lenses. But I had already owned three full frame lenses, so I didn't feel like I needed to jump back into the full frame lens market if I got a second A7S III. The only thing holding me back, and the one thing that I think holds all of us back, was the price point. It's the most expensive camera out of all of these cameras that I shot with this year in this video. And to swing a second one would be a pretty tough decision. I also would have loved the opportunity to be able to throw it into my pocket and take it with me on the go, maybe even have a lens attached to it. And that takes us to the ZV-1 Mark II. Around April of 2023, I was pleasantly surprised when Sony reached out and asked if I would like to review the Sony ZV-1 Mark II before it hit the markets. And naturally, I said yes.
From a user's perspective, it was very close or very similar to the ZV-1. It had a fixed lens that was attached to the camera. It had decent stabilization and it had a lot of the things that the ZV-1 had like ND filter system built in. The fact that it had a fixed lens made me not really worry about what lens I was using when I was out in the field. I could just pull my ZV-1 out and go out and start shooting rather than having to take that extra step and think about what lens would look best for this situation. So it was a really nice camera to have to either slip it into my pocket or put it into my camera bag and just go. It did have decent stabilization, but when I was going handheld with it, when I put it into active stabilization, it was a little bit too punched close to my face and I wasn't feeling like I had gotten super gimbal-like footage like I did with the ZV-E1. Also, it was an 8-bit camera, so it wasn't going to compete against the 10-bit cameras that are out on the market. But even though it was an 8-bit camera, it is a Sony camera, so the image quality was awesome. It was crazy to see the shots that I was able to get when I just threw it up onto a gimbal and I did some low-light shots in a building, I went downtown, and I even shot at night. It really did have a wow factor just like the ZV-1. But the reason I knew that it wasn't my camera that I was searching for because it didn't have HFR or high frame rate mode like the previous ZV-1 Mark I had. I had already owned the ZV-1 for almost three years by this point. The ZV-1 Mark II didn't offer enough upgrades for me to justify upgrading to the ZV-1 Mark II. In fact, I think if I didn't have either of them purchased and I had to get one, I might go with the ZV-1 purely because of the high frame rate mode, which gives you super slow motion shots, which opens up your creative pathways. The ZV-1 is one of my favorite point and shoot cameras because it's versatile, and you're pretty much limitless with creative options. It's actually funny because this channel was pretty much started off the back of this camera. So I have to show loyalty to it. And I love the fact that it has a built-in ND filter. Can't tell you how many times I've been out in sunny environments and turned that bad boy on to fix my exposure settings. For those of you who don't know, an ND filter system is basically sunglasses internally on the lens so that you can shoot better out in bright environments or high key environments without having to crank up the shutter speed or the aperture. Still, although a second ZV-1 wouldn't be a bad choice, I really needed an EVF for some photography options and some 10-bit video would have been great. My conclusion was I would just save my money and keep on waiting for the next camera to drop. I am a Sony guy, but I'm also a camera guy first. So I wasn't opposed to jumping into Fuji, Canon, or the Nikon ecosystem, but it did have to feel right. The Nikon Z30 was comparable to the ZV-E10. And it was a little bit cheaper. When I got it, I was like, wow, the image quality is insane. It's better than the Sony ZV-E10 footage, in my opinion. The pictures were a little bit more sharp, and for what I was using it for, I was very impressed. I'm tempted to call this little APS-C camera the Swiss army knife of cameras because of what it produced. I love the variety of buttons on the Z30 compared to something like the ZV-E10. The only thing that I found, I don't know, maybe I didn't do the settings right, was the autofocus was a lot slower than when I compared it to the Sony ZV-E10. The autofocus is pretty important to me, especially because usually I'm in fast paced environments and I need my camera at least to do the autofocus work so I can focus more on the exposure and the white balance. I actually have no idea how I ended up with this camera. I mean, I rented it, but I don't know what I was thinking when I decided to rent this camera. I don't even think they sell it anymore, but I did compare it to the ZV-E10 and I believe the ZV-E10 blew it out of the water. Not so much in image quality, but more in functionality. I mean, the image quality out of the ZV-E10, in my opinion, was a lot better, but it beat it in things like stabilization, autofocus, and I think the display was even brighter on the ZV-E10. So if you're thinking about picking up the Canon M50 Mark II, don't do it. Go with the Canon R50 or the ZV-E10. Either way, it made it a lot easier to decide not to go with the Canon M50 Mark II in my search. But the next camera did put me between a rock and a hard place. When I first considered the A6400, I thought, 
there's no way it could live up to the ZV-E10. For some reason, when I shoot straight out of camera with the 6400, it automatically has a nice look to it. I'm sure there's other cameras out there that have the same sensor as the 6400 that give off a similar picture, but I'm used to these newer sensors like in the ZV-E10 and the A6700, which has a great image quality, but the colors, they're just different from what the old sensors on the A6400 had. I thought it would make the perfect B-cam for what I was doing content creation-wise. There were rumors spreading on the internet that a new camera was about to drop in the 6000 series, and it'd be coming out very soon. So I decided to wait. I'm sure you probably saw that one coming, and yes, this camera was something to behold. If you've watched this channel for a while, you know how much I love the Sony a6700. It's got everything that I need, and although it's not perfect, it comes in very close to exactly what I was looking for. 422 10-bit, 4K up to 120, it has an EVF, it has that newer menu system, it has the AI chip for better autofocus and stabilization, and it has auto reframing. It was small, portable, great for travel, good for client work, but with that smaller body size comes overheating issues, which spread like wildfire on the internet. Not to mention, it seemed as though right after they released the Sony a6700, Sony was about to drop another major camera or a pair of cameras into the market. While I was waiting to see what other major cameras Sony was about to drop, I decided to rent the Sony a7C. If you don't know, this full frame camera will always outperform APS-C cameras, especially in low light, mostly in image quality. The a7C was basically an updated a7 III which was also a full frame camera, and I owned that camera for three years. When I purchased the a7 III back in the day, I think it was over $2,000, and now you can pick up the a7C for about $1,500 US, which is very comparable price to the 6700. Should I just go with the full frame a7C instead of picking up the APS-C a6700? I wasn't 100% sure about that, and if I was gonna go full frame with the a7C, it only had one card slot, why wouldn't I just go with something like the a7 IV, which had two card slots and a full-size HDMI port? If the Nikon Z30 is the Swiss Army knife of all APS-C cameras, then the Sony a7 IV is the Swiss Army knife of all cameras, period. Sony loaned me out an a7 IV so I could test it out. And one incredible feature that this camera has is crop mode, so you can use APS-C lenses on this full frame camera. You usually can use full frame lenses on APS-C cameras, but you can't use APS-C lenses on full frame cameras unless they have crop mode, which the a7 IV had. The fact that it had crop mode was huge because I already owned three full frame lenses and several APS-C lenses. So now I could interchange all of these lenses on this full frame camera and it had a dual card slot and it could shoot an s cinetone but it was a bigger body than i was hoping to get i was really in the market for more of a portable camera an on-the-go camera i already have an a7s3 and that's pretty big in itself and i wasn't opposed to going with an aps-c camera Sony also sent me the 6600 so I could give it a try and I wasn't too impressed with this camera compared to all of the other cameras that I used up until this point. The 6600 is a really nice camera. It has 4K 30 frames per second and display goes vertical up rather than out and articulating like the other more recent Sony cameras that we've seen. But I really wanted to get my hands on a camera that could shoot in 4K 120. Don't get me wrong, it was an amazing camera, it had great autofocus, and if it was the only camera that I got, I'd be happy with it. Also, something else to consider when you're shopping for a camera, if you're not into photography right now, you might be in the future. So you're gonna wanna get a camera with the highest megapixel possible so that you can really scale around your images in post-production and have more room to grade. And that brings us to the next camera. This was another time that I was blessed with Sony reaching out to me and asking if I wanted to review their Sony A7CR before it hits the markets. And what do you think I said? If you've ever shot with a 61 megapixel camera, you've got to try it. Which made this camera the perfect camera for shooting thumbnails. It was a full frame camera and I'm fine with that, 
but the price point was pretty high. I had it for about two weeks and shot everything from product videography to pet photography to my own YouTube video. I think I shot three or four YouTube headshots with that camera while I had it. I think it also has seven stops of stabilization and you can really see it, especially when you go handheld, whether you're shooting video or photography. You can shoot in a lot lower of a shutter speed and not have so much shake in your image. And when you're shooting video, less shake is always better. The only problem of this camera was the price point. It was inching up close to that $3,000 mark and it only had one card slot. So all that extra money for all that extra megapixel and the extra stops of stabilization just didn't justify it for me. But what did catch my attention was the Sony a7C II. I went to Sony's condo event and rented this camera while I was there for her two days and I shot with all different types of lenses. This camera was amazing and it also had pretty good stabilization. It wasn't as good as the Sony ZV-E1's dynamic active stabilization, but it still was really great. The A7C II would be great in low light situations, but still it only had one card slot. If it shot in 4K 120, then I probably would have just gone with that camera because sometimes that 4K 120 is a must depending on what your creative needs are. Also, I had to remember that while I was at that event, I was using very expensive lenses. So if I wanted that actual image or image quality that I was getting at the event, I would almost have to spend over $5,000 just to get a good lens to go with that full frame camera. So I turned my sights to the iPhone 15 Pro. Although the iPhone 15 Pro can only shoot in 4K up to 60, it could shoot internally in ProRes Log, which means I could essentially get super flat washed out images and really be able to color grade that footage to my own desire in Final Cut Pro. Maybe I could just save all this money and pick up the 15 Pro instead of a dedicated camera. The only problem is it's a phone and it has a phone sensor. So even though it's an amazing camera and I could potentially use it for client shoots, and shoot and say ProRes log footage, that way I could match up my A7S III footage. It takes up huge file sizes, and I think it would look kind of weird if this was my B-cam and I had a USB-C SSD coming out the side so I could record externally. But those file sizes are huge and kind of a pain to offload from the iPhone to a Mac, unless I was recording externally to an SSD drive using a USB-C cord. But who wants to carry around that, especially when you're shooting professional client work? I don't know how good that would look if you had an iPhone with the USB-C come into an SSD as your B-cam. So I had my sights set on a dedicated camera and it was good timing because Fuji just came out with another camera called the Fuji XS20 a few months before this. This camera could be considered the exact competitor to the Sony A6700. I made a video where I compared the 6700 and the XS20 together, and it was a close matchup. The one huge advantage the XS20 has compared to the Sony, Canon, or Nikon cameras that I have mentioned up until this point is it can shoot in 6.2K open gate, meaning you can use the entire area of the sensor. Can you do that with the Nikon Z30? I don't remember. Anyways, you can with the XS20. That means this camera is the perfect camera for virtual vertical content because you would have more room to move the image around while you're shooting an open gate. But I found just like the Fuji X-H2, the X-S20 gives off a filmic look that's just different than what you normally get with all the other cameras that I've mentioned. It just makes you want to go out, have some fun, shoot an entire documentary, shoot an interview, and just go play with it. I've often wondered why Fuji cameras have such a different look to them, and I think it might be because the white balance sensor on the outside of the camera is more accurate than what we get with the other cameras that I mentioned. But I did hear that Fuji has the same exact sensor as Sony cameras, so I'm not sure I understand why that is or even if this is true. And finally, the Sony a7 III I used sporadically throughout the year. Like I mentioned, this was a camera that I had for three years and I used it on everything from client shoots to B-roll and filming some side projects with it. But while I had it, I did bang it up pretty good. I think I dropped it two or three times. I never got a cage for it. 
like I should have. And the HDMI out barely works anymore because I loosened up that port. So I have had a lot of experience with the Sony a7 III and I would have no problem going out and picking up a second one and just using it as my A cam, B cam setup and just going ahead and selling my a7S III. Picking up a couple really nice GM lenses for two a7s III's would not be a bad choice if all I was doing was shooting client headshots where I could shoot in 4K 24. But because this camera only shoots in 4K up to 30, it really limited me for how much B-roll I could get, especially when I'm out doing any type of client work. Also, with all the advancements that Sony has made over the past few years, it would almost feel like I'm taking a step backwards if I went and got one of these older cameras. So after it was all said and done and I shot with every single one of those cameras extensively over the past year, I decided to pick up the Sony A6700 and the iPhone 15 Pro, but that's more for phone work, not camera work. Mainly because this camera has everything that I need. I love the button layout, the fact that it can shoot in 422 10-bit, 4K up to 120. It has that AI auto reframing function. It's got really nice autofocus. It can focus on different things like planes, trains, automobiles, insects, birds. It has an EVF and it just makes the entire experience very pleasurable. Now this camera is not perfect. It does overheat. It overheats when you're outside in hotter temperatures. I've never had it overheat on me, but I haven't used it enough to be able to sit here and say I've used it for two years and I can tell you that this thing overheats in over 90 degree weather. I did test out the overheating on the 6700 in ambient room temperatures like I am right now, and I wasn't getting the best results in the world. But I do think a firmware update may fix that problem. So there's 20 cameras that I shot with this year, and I tried to give you as much information about each one of them as possible as this video progressed. If you want more in-depth look at each one of these cameras, I pretty much made a video about each one of them or comparing them to another camera, and I'll leave that in the description. If you don't already, don't forget to follow me at the Film Lions. Thanks for watching this video and have a nice week.